Welcome everyone. Oh, look at this. Hi, Louise. Hi, Cheryl from Iowa. Oh, this is great. Welcome everyone. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Miriam. Um, somebody asked, can you see me? And actually, because this is a webinar format, um, you guys will be able to see us, but the, pan the um, attendees can't see each other. So the, the chat's a nice way for everyone to know who's here. So we'll just keep letting people in and uh, get started in a couple minutes. Hi, Ellen. We have Glenn Gardner here, one of the artists. You can see his work uh, in one of the slides. Hello, everyone. So nice that everybody's tuning in to the mm -hmm. chat. It's wonderful. Yeah. For those of you um, that are just joining us, we'll get started in a couple minutes. Um, and uh, for anyone who wants to share where they're tuning in from, and if you're associated with Peters Valley, it's really nice to gather all these people together and nice to see who's here. Hi, Wendy Holmes, noise. Great to see you. Hi, Helen. <laughs> Welcome everyone. We have about 170 people that are going to tune in tonight and 105 have shown up. So give us a few more minutes. Welcome everyone. As Kristen just said, we're, uh, we're just letting people in. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Oh, great to see so many people tuning in. This is really lovely. Um, for those of you just joining, we'll get started in a couple minutes, but people are just putting in where they are um, tuning in from uh, and any association with Peters Valley, if they like, uh, into the chat. All right. Just a couple more minutes here. Thanks for everyone's patience. Hi, Doug Bucci. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to those who are just joining. We'll get started in just a moment. Hi, Carl C. Muller, an artist in the exhibition. It's great to have you all here. So many friends. Thank you for joining us. This is so exciting. All right. Do we think we're we're just about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Marjorie Nathanson, the Executive Director of Hunted and Art Museum. Welcome to our virtual celebration of From the Ground Up, Peters Valley School of Craft. We're so happy to have so many people here. Thanks for joining us. Behind me is a shot of our main gallery so that you can get a peek of the wonderful show that curator Elizabeth Esner has organized for us and has curated for us. A show that I hope you will visit in person starting tomorrow and into January. There will also be a video and a tour by Elizabeth on our website. Through exhibitions, a studio school and other educational programs, Hunted and Art Museum carries out its mission to, for, um, to present craft, art and design. So when Kristen Muller, the executive director of Peters Valley contacted me several years ago about the possibility of doing an exhibition to honor the 50th anniversary of Peters Valley, I jumped at the chance. It seemed the perfect opportunity to collaborate with and highlight another institution that shares a love of craft. And I'm so glad I did. The show and catalog tell the story of Peters Valley and spotlight the terrific artists who have been associated with the school. And we are excited also because we will be hosting artist residencies during the run of the exhibition. Uh, Cynthia Alberto, Lauren Eckert, and Janine Wang will be with us on weekends during the run of the show. So check our website for dates and times. I want to thank Kristen and Elizabeth and all of the people who made this exhibition possible. It was a huge effort and they did such a great job. In a few seconds, Kristen will be thanking the funders of the exhibition. At this time, I'd like to thank some of the funders of the Art Museum, the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, the Large Foundation, Hunterdon County Cultural and Heritage Commission, Janssen Pharmaceuticals and the Holt Charitable Foundation. And I'd also like to remind everybody that the museum's annual members exhibition opens tomorrow as well. So there's a lot to see at the museum and I hope we see you there. And now I'm delighted to introduce the director of Peters Valley, Kristen Muller. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, I am just so delighted that you're all joining us tonight and so extremely grateful to have gotten to this point. Um, my heart is just filled with gratitude for all the people that have made this exhibition possible, all the collaborative efforts, partnerships, the financial support, all the elbow grease that went into making this happen in the research. It's just really pretty incredible. Um, and as Marjorie said, you know, we, we, I approached her and she was so warm and welcoming to the idea. Um, we didn't know exactly how we were going to pull it off, how we were going to get the funding and how we were going to locate all the work, um, but we did it. Um, and I'm just so grateful to the fact that the Hunterdon uh, Museum agreed to work with us. I'd like to um, thank the funders um, most specifically because they helped fund the research, the catalog and the production of this exhibition. And um, beginning with the Wingate Foundation, who we approached for a curatorial fellowship. And the Wingate Foundation has been so great about uh, sponsoring scholarship in craft and, and critical craft theory. And um, through this program, we met Elizabeth Esner, our brilliant curator. Um, they also supported the uh, production of the catalog and the exhibition. Next, I'd like to call out a huge thank you to the New Jersey Council for the Humanities um, because they helped with a lot of the financial support for producing the show, the actual hanging and all the things that go into shipping and receiving and uh, presenting. Um, and thank you specifically to Gigi and James for, for all of their wonderful help. I also would like to thank one of our funders, Marie and John Zimmerman Fund, because they gave us a special gift for this museum exhibition and um, our 50th anniversary. Also to John Sheridan and Andrea Duflan for their support of the catalog and lending us uh, works for the show from their own collection and their words of encouragement. And a very, very special thank you to our lenders. Um, we're very grateful to the generosity of Helen English Drutt. Hello, Helen. Nice to see that you're here tonight. Julie Schaffler-Dale 
I've heard so much about you from Tommy Simpson. Thank you so much. Um, the Clay Studio, the New Jersey State Museum that lent from their um, collection. Thank you all for lending us your important pieces. Thank you also to the graphics office for your beautiful design work, for the didactics, the catalog, counselor books, for pr producing the catalog. Um, I'd like to thank all of the funders for Peters Valley, um, and there are many, our partnership with the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, which is a beautiful public-private partnership that's been in, in business for 50 years. Um, and I would really like to congratulate you, Elizabeth, on a job well done. Elizabeth's enthusiasm, tenacity, curiosity, scholarship, um, willingness to go way above and beyond the program to make sure that we got some great stories, great pieces. She brought innovation to the exhibition. It's not just a retrospective. Um, through the residencies, we're bringing craft alive. And uh, thank you, congratulations. And I hope that all of you will make a point of coming to see the show. Thank you also, lastly, to the Peters Valley Board and my amazing staff and the Hunterdon staff who worked so hard to make this happen. Thank you and congratulations. Oh, thanks so much, Kristen. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, hello, everyone. I am Elizabeth Esner. I am the curator of From the Ground Up. And tonight, as you heard from Marjorie and Kristen, really brings together the culmination of contributions from so many that are here in this Zoom room tonight. Um, one of the positive outcomes of our very strange current situation is that we can gather regardless of physical location. So I am so happy to have so many of you from the Peters Valley and from the Hunterdon and Art Museum communities here tonight. Welcome. So I hope that there will be a lot of questions from all of you for me, for our artists who will be speaking tonight, and we would love to hear them. So uh, as you think of them, you can just put them in that little Q&A at the bottom and we will have them ready to go for the final section of our program. So when I first began working on this project, I knew Peters Valley was a craft school and that it had been founded 50 years ago in 1970. But what I found was that the results of what was really a very experimental idea, a planned craft residency-based community and a school set in the landscape of a national park, the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, has resulted in a much larger and often untold history. I found a place that has had significant impact on larger artistic and craft histories and on the trajectory of individual artistic careers. So in putting this exhibition together and catalog together, I knew I could never tell the whole 50 year history or really what are many histories. But as I began talking with artists, with craftspeople who had been residents, students, assistants, instructors, staff, sometimes all of the above, uh, in my conversations about their experiences, there was this one word that kept bubbling up. And that word was formative, this moment in time where something takes shape. And this, this idea of a formative moment um, really became my organizing principle. It was a chance to capture connections between artists and their materials, between students and instructors, and a way to capture a formative moment in time for each of Peters Valley's material disciplines that have really overall shaped the vital spirit of this place over the last 50 years. So tonight I thought I would give you a little glimpse into some of the moments in the exhibition. And what we're looking at here is uh, early woodworking at Peters Valley, which you see here, including the legacy of Emil Milan, residents and assistants, John Sheridan, Carolyn Gru Sheridan, Carl C. Muller, and Andy Wilner, who we'll hear from tonight. So fiber of the 1970s is also something we'll focus on, uh, including an incredible thread poem from Louise Todd Cope and the work of Janet Lipkin, who you see here, a major figure in the art to wear movement. And she will be joining us to tell a little bit about her time at Peters Valley as well. Go ahead, next slide. Um, here are two 
of the many works from seven photographers, the Delaware Valley, a traveling exhibition organized in 1977 by our first Peters Valley's first photography resident, Wendy Holmes Noyes. Um, there is a sort of mini retrospective of this photography exhibition in From the Ground Up. So the exhibition, of course, examines the building of the Anagama, Peters Valley's famed Anagama, built in 1980, first fired in 1981, uh, the first in the US for public use. And of course, it has been a site of inspiration for ceramic artists since. We will also look at the legacy of the ceramics program for artists like Malcolm Mabotu Smith, who is here this evening and will be talking to us a little bit. Blacksmithing has been a part of Peters Valley's history from the beginning. And this exhibition looks at artists working in the late 1990s and early 2000s. John Race, Megan Crowley, and Vivian Beer, who is here tonight, will be sharing a little bit of what, about her experience and what's behind this chair that you're looking at here, the Lowrider Lounge. And finally, contemporary jewelry, where today Peters Valley has informed the careers and hosted some of the most exciting artists in the field, including Doug Bucci, MJ Tyson, Beryl Perrin Feller, and Lucy Jockel, who is joining us this evening. But there was this other kind of formative moment that is really essential to Peters Valley that I knew I wanted to share in this exhibition as well. So how do you tell the story of a craft school? As we all know, it's not just the finished object on a pedestal or in one's hands, but it is this artistic and material understanding that has taken root long before. So this exhibition really looks at Peters Valley School of Craft from two directions. It is a beautiful exhibition of objects that I hope I've given you a little sneak peek into, but you can also see hopefully in person if you're able to, but it also includes an artist residency. Resident artists living and working on site were where Peters Valley really began 50 years ago. So today for this exhibition, three remarkable artists who will, will take turns in the gallery. And that includes jeweler Lauren Eckert, woodworker Janine Wang, whose hands you see here making one of her hybrid turned wood baskets and weaver and activist Cynthia Alberto, who will we'll hear from directly tonight, telling us a little bit about her project that will be happening in the galleries of the Hunterdon. And they will each, I think, actually I know, will share some of the magic that we all know happens between artist, process, and material that brings a piece of work to life. So finally, this project includes a beautiful catalog uh, that has been very smartly designed by the graphics office, who also did the graphics for the show. The catalog will be available on October 23rd, so just a few weeks. Um, it'll be available on Amazon and on the websites of Peters Valley and the Hunter Inn, and we'll certainly let you know when it's available. This project has been a true labor of love uh, with so many people to thank for their considerable contributions to my partner institutions, Kristen, Marjorie, the incredible staffs of the Hunter Inn Art Museum, Peters Valley, they have shared their time, their dedication, their expertise, and their enthusiasm every step of the way. And in particular, I want to recognize Grace Reff and Ellen Mayer for their diligence on this project. Our lenders have so generously shared the wonders of their collections to tell this important story, and we are grateful. Our funders, as well, have been truly essential partners. Without them, we would not be able to realize what has really become the first major survey of Peters Valley School of Craft. So thank you. The artists, however, are really at the center of Peters Valley. And I am grateful to every one of them for their generosity in sharing their stories, their histories, their objects, so we can tell the story. Their lived experience is really at the heart of what has made Peters Valley vital for 50 years. And I'm so looking forward to hearing some of these stories tonight. So first up, I will introduce Andy Wilner, who was with Carl C. Muller, the first residence in wood at Peters Valley. Thank you. Um, I recently watched a video of a conversation between my 27 year old self and Jim Doubleday, who was the first blacksmith resident. We were leaning against his forge in his studio 
And we were pontificating that we would probably be the last generation of studio craft artists. We were so damn wrong. Um, and Peter's Valley proved us wrong. 50 years later, the spirit of community, collaboration, and commitment to craft artistry that the first residents and founders midwife has blossomed into a life-changing experience for anyone who has ever taught or learned here. Being among the first residents was a privilege. The responsibility for, cre for creating our own workspaces and teaching in unfinished studios did not seem like a hardship at all. Instead, it helped to solidify our commitment to each other and to place. For most of us, it was our earliest experience living communally and collaboratively and having our first professional studios. The piece that you see on this slide was a rocking bird that I made for my daughter, Emily, when she was a child. Um, I have a Hunterton Art Center story. I, my, I had my first exhibit. It was a group show from Peters Valley Artists at the museum. My dad, uh, who was, re was kind of reluctant about my choice of career, came. He kind of looked around, but then he saw a red dot. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, that mean it's sold. And for the rest of the exhibit, he walked around saying, my son did that. He sold that piece. My son did that. And I was, again, I, had, um, I became the professional he always wanted to be in his eyes. Next slide. Looking back to those early days, we had the good fortune to have the time and the space to build a portfolio, show and sell our work, and begin building a career. Having an affordable place to live, making lasting friendships, and learning the secret of living and what I'm calling an unintentional community have had lifelong implications for me. Learning from each other was an important element of those early days. We're always in and out of each other's homes and studios. Um, all of us were able to take a hand at iron forging, jewelry making, ceramics, fiber arts, and we even baked bread and cooked for the students. I also learned how excruciating but fun it was when it was my turn to be a nude model at our weekly figure drawing classes. Uh, the volcano table is, uh, was done in, I'm thinking 1979, it was done in my studio in Thompson, Pennsylvania. It's mahogany and spalted maple. And it's kind of the playful stage I got into once I really had had a chance to master my craft. It's traditional joinery and stacked and laminated and carved, but um, it's the first of a series of uh, very sculptural pieces of furniture. Next slide. I met my mentor and friend, Emil Milan, when he showed up at my house, the one up by the waterfall, if you've ever been at Peters Valley. And he showed up unexpectedly one evening. The house is already full of young interns and apprentices there, but we squeezed him in. And he captivated all of us uh, with both his stories and his skills. Emil, who has finally gotten the recognition he so richly deserves through uh, retrospective retrospective exhibits and a publication, Emil Milan, at mid the mid-century master, has confirmed his status among the best 20th century wood sculptures. But more than that, Emil was my mentor, my friend, and eventually my neighbor and my daughter Emily's surrogate uncle. One night, while I was still at Peters Valley, I, I was working on a big commission and struggling with the carving. Emil, who is no lightweight, pulled over and sat down on one of Carl C. Muller's fragile looking stools. He lit a stogie and just watched. During the next few hours through gesture and subvocal comments, grunts and courteous suggestions, and some not so courteous suggestions, um, my carving was literally transformed during those few hours. Emil did the same thing for anyone who ever took his class or shared a glass. 
and I miss him terribly. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this anniversary celebration of this most revered institution. Well, thank you so much, Andy. That's a really beautiful, really woven together some beautiful connections between yourself and Peter's Valley and your own trajectory in the world. Um, next up, I want to introduce Janet Lipkin, uh, one of the earliest residents in fiber at Peter's Valley and, of course, a pioneer in the art to wear movement. I'll start again. I had to unmute. I just want to thank everyone for being invited to the exhibit and to be on the panel and to thank my mother who saw an ad in the paper about artists in residence community, sent it to me in California. I went back, I interviewed, and the rest is history. So Peter's Valley helped me form the structure of my life as an artist, craftsperson, and educator. The dynamic and intimate setting of living in an artist community is one I would recreate my entire life. As an artist, it is important for me to share my narrative by telling stories through my work. Each piece becomes a metaphor for something greater. Ideas and materials are what drive me. I never let my technique restrict my artistic vision, and therefore I'm free to invent what hasn't been done before. The piece you're looking at right now, the bird coat, was crocheted using all natural dyed yarn. I was playing with scale and observation while creating this piece. I used a variety of hooks and yarn mixtures to create tiny and large forms. A bird to me symbolizes freedom, a spiritual transformation. The image of a bird is one that I would return too often. There's one above my head that you can see. In this photo, I'm standing in Peter's Valley having a photo taken to document this piece. Obviously, never imagining anyone would see this photo. Years later, I would marry Barry Shapiro, a photographer, and my work would be photographed in a more professional light. Next slide. The man's vest, animal skin, was an exploration of building organic forms, freely allowing forms to create the narrative. I was interested in integrating fleece into my work as I crochet. When completed, I brushed the fleece to create a fur-like texture. Pockets were created by crocheting around leather. And I believe I'm one of the very first people who did that. Next slide. Jacob's robe of many colors was inspired by the Bible story. As you saw, this is in the exhibit. On the back of the hood, I wove a tapestry of a face, thus making the back of the robe the front of a doll. The colorful woven strips are formed by crocheting them directly into the garment, creating a strong graphic texture that is balanced by the smooth velvet yoke applied to the top of the robe. Nothing was precious to me. It was important for me to explore different techniques, materials, and stitches each time I created a new piece. I still follow this process. It's always a risk what the journey will bring, but the magic lies in trusting the unknown. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. And you can see this piece in person uh, in the exhibition. It is really absolutely remarkable um, and a sight to behold. Um, we are going to hear next from Malcolm Mubotu-Smith. Um, who joined Peter's Valley as a student and then an assistant in the late 1980s and returned in 2019 as a visiting instructor. So he has had a long trajectory uh, with or long relationship with Peter's Valley. So Malcolm. 
Thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to Elizabeth, thank you to Kristen, the entire Peters Valley family, past and present, and to the Hunterton for putting on this fabulous exhibition. Um, as Elizabeth is mentioning, I did start there as a student, a young nascent uh, high schooler in 1987. Uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, in a situation in high school that allowed me to major in, of all things, ceramics and as a fine art major. And my uh, fellow alumnus, Chris Staley, was one of the uh, teachers there at Peters Valley, which drew me there. And it was the first time that I was able to live and work and see amazing artists from all walks of life across the world in one place where they are dedicated to what their passion was and what my passion was going to be. Um, I later turned around and came back as a senior and was a, an assistant there for the summer, working with the likes of Ken Ferguson, a Korean master carver, and a number of other visitors from, from that summer. And Ken would later become my mentor at Kansas City Art Institute that, that very fall uh, when I started my undergraduate career. Next slide, please. Flash forward uh, to the year 2008, nine and 10 with the uh, election of uh, Barack Obama. My uh, matriculation through undergrad to graduate school and on to becoming a faculty member at uh, Western Kentucky University and then Indiana University. Uh, my work took a turn away from my passion, which is making pots and vessel sculpture to reflecting on all of the urgencies and anxieties that were raised by the vicious stuff that is still unfolding itself today with uh, our unease in this country with dealing with race. And so I felt the need to make this series of works that sort of put a face on it. And so I used these racial stereotype objects uh, on one side of these pieces that from the reverse side sort of imitate and play with the formalist structure of modern, modern art from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s that also pulled on the history of African art. And so I wanted there to be kind of a gut punch when you walk around this object. Um, next slide, please. And all that being said, that work uh, uh, comprises about a suite of 12 pieces. I'm, I'm happy that the museum has this object for you guys to enjoy and, and study. But my passion is to be recognized as an artist and who makes uh, fabulous abstract vessels. And uh, my passion is to play with vessel forms as a, a mirror of my agency in the hip hop culture. I pull from all kinds of pop culture references, be it uh, comic books, graffiti, the history of uh, vessels on the globe. Uh, and you'll see them all sort of collage together in a kind of hip hop stance of mix, mixology that I like to call. And so you see here a finished piece from 2015 uh, a very contemporary piece that's finished called uh, um, Relic One, Cloud, Cloud Scoop. And you'll see some works in progress here where I'm starting to really uh, double down in my carving and I uh, hope to have these things finished soon. So uh, thank you all. Uh, Peters Valley has been an amazing pivot point. I'm blessed to have had the opportunity to come full circle from student to teacher. And uh, thank you for sharing all of this. And I feel humbled to be part of this group of amazing collaborators and uh, resident artists that have made Peters Valley such an amazing and potent artistic location. Well, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I love what you said about full circle. I think that's a really, really beautiful way to say it. Um, next up, we will be talking to Vivian Beer, uh, who was resident, who was an assistant in the blacksmithing department under John Race. Um, and she's going to share a little bit about her time there and about her work. Hi there. Uh, so as you can see, the blacksmithing studio, very, very traditional. Um, and I was rolling in there when John Ray's, uh, late 90s, John Ray's was running the studio there. And I was coming out of a, uh, a sculpture program. And uh, next slide. Uh, Next slide. Um, this is what it looked like. So me and just a pile of dudes, right? Uh, so you're thinking like, uh, this picture would look very different now. So as two decades later, I like, I like to think that the blacksmithing uh, community has changed quite a bit in terms of um, integrating, uh, you know, different ages and different genders, different perspectives. But this passion for metalworking uh, is, is the 
the kind of crux of it. I love the way that uh, Elizabeth, the way you use the word uh, formative, and it certainly was a formative time for me um, as I was there as a little 21 year old and um, just fell in love with more than just the material of metal, but rather this passion for intimate process that I think is key to the craft school experience that that accesses a completely different part of our hearts and minds. And I know I'm telling the story of so many people, not only those of us that have gone on to a professional life in the arts, but everyone that comes to these schools to have that experience with their hearts and their minds. And to me, that's really the formative change in that because I was studying fine arts before I got there and then next slide, tumbled into this sort of, um, this, this uh, love of material, this sort of love of the intimate experience with material. Now that said, I think specifically as being a metal worker, that also makes you think about tools. Um, and we always have a, a sort of intermediary of tools with our material. Next slide. And for me, that went on to be a pivot um, into not only using traditional techniques that you might find like symbol bending jigs like that, but also into digital design and fabrication over time. And I, next slide, I think that's one of the interesting things about this group that you've narrowed in, those of us that are kind of 90s and beyond of the blacksmithing community, next slide, that have really are using a way of thinking, but accessing uh, what you would almost think of as other fields. So sort of diverging from this sort of uh, traditional vision of the Smith, and that is somebody that's working, um, you know, just with heat or with uh, smaller um, functional objects, next slide, but rather taking this sort of point of view and, and, and moving into really any tool, right? So being able to access all the different uh, jig making skills that you can have with the really amazing tape measure of uh, CAD CAM design. Next slide. Um, I feel like I've been taking, taking sort of this intimacy with material that I got from my time in that shop over there in Peters Valley um, and the sort of uh, the transformative experience of spending you know, really two decades since my time there. Um, in the craft world while sort of being in this, this ever-changing digital sphere that we now are completely embedded in, even here in this opening. Next slide. Um, but I think, and, and this is of course sort of an evolution of the piece that's in the show, um, I think that intimacy that we get through the craft school experience hasn't changed at all, right? So even though a lot has changed culturally um, and obviously in the types of tools and the ways that we think about ourselves and others in say the past two decades since the first time that I hit Peters Valley, I think that our, that the relationships that we have there and the sort of essential humanity hasn't changed at all. And um, I'm really, of course, as everybody said, it's honored to be able to voice what I think is a sort of common experience with places like Peters Valley that were sort of, um, I'm, it's amazing that we have them and as a safe place to grow as artists. That's beautifully put, Vivian. And I love that as you guys are talking, there are these incredibly common themes that are really coming up um, that all of you um, have have put your own histories to so beautifully. Um, finally, we are going to hear uh, from Lucy Jockel. Well, actually not finally, but we're gonna hear from Lucy Jockel who was the Fine Metals Fellow in 2017. And you were talking about those sort of intimacy scales and larger scales. And this is an incredible work that is quite intimate that she's gonna tell us a little bit about. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Elizabeth. And Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I was the Fine Metals Fellow in 2017. I, um, and I also have been fortunate enough to return as an instructor the following summers. And I'm currently the coordinator and lecturer at Towson University in the Metals and Jewelry Program. 
Um, so this piece you see here is made of honeybee wings um, in this sort of lace-like textile, which is wrapped around a doe skull. And so I work within um, jewelry as a foundation, and then I kind of tap into textile and also photography in my work. And I was able to explore that a little bit during my time at Peters Valley. And so this piece really serves as a memorial for honeybees who are facing extinction. And I use, hunt, I use animal remains to comment on our connection with these animals and reference uh, Victorian mourning rituals, such as wearing a veil, like in this piece. And the honeybee wings came from honeybees who had died of natural causes. I received them from a beekeeper in Rhode Island who lost his hives after a harsh winter. And in exchange, I helped him to prepare his hives for new bees. And so as someone who deeply cares about our environment and makes work about our connection to it, you can imagine how inspiring the beautiful landscape of Peters Valley was during my time there. And I felt really, really connected, not only to the creatures there um, that we were surrounded by um, that I, and that I focus um, on in my work, but also to a community of craftspeople while at Peters Valley. You can go to the next slide. And so this is a photo in the fine metal studio. And it was during one of the, I believe one of the open studio tours. Um, and so if, if there's anything I took away from my experience at Peters Valley, it's really that community is imperative to the process of making. And this young man you see here, who I believe that him and his family are, have a close relationship with Peters Valley and are regulars there. Um, he's, he was so curious about craft and the various mediums and he had this pure excitement for craft that I witnessed again and again in every workshop. Um, so that was just one interaction of many at Peters Valley that really stuck with me, where I realized that craft really is this shared experience. And it's about the conversations that um, begin with objects that keep me curious. So thank you again, Elizabeth and Hunterdon Museum for including me in this show, alongside all these really incredible um, artists and to Peters Valley for providing community centered around craft. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, you know, I love what you said about community is imperative to making. And I think that that's something that has really come through. But I, and it's interesting because Cynthia Alberto, who's gonna be speaking next, she'll tell us a little bit about how we're sort of bringing that forward in her incredible project that will be at the Hunterdon starting tomorrow. She will be there weaving. So Cynthia, tell us a little bit more. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you Hunterdon and Peters Valley. Um, yes, I'm gonna be tomorrow at the museum, but I'm just, this is like a sneak preview of what you're gonna see. So the piece, in front is my Techno Love Cocoon series. The one on the left, which is um, my hair series, it's um, hand woven with different um, hair materials. And the one on the right is my wire series, which is more of a, a sculpture, so you could bend it. So I love the whole idea that you could play with different materials and it's not just like flat on the wall. So the cocoons, if we could just go to the next um, slide. The cocoons are made of um, neon ropes that I inherited from the MoMA PS1 exhibition in 2017 from the exhibition called Weaving the Courtyard. So we wove 40 of these cocoons and they're quite heavy because they are after the pressured um, blankets when you use when you're having an anxiety, you know, kids that are, have have going through some, um, um, like they need to calm down. So they are pretty heavy and they, they um, dance, they dance on a techno love um, music because I went to a techno love, um, what do you call it, concert. And I was wishing I had one of these then. <laughs> so they're there, they activate, they activate on different levels. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So you can see it right here. They are at, in front of the Friedman Gallery in 2018. So activating on like more of a sculpture. So people would pass by and the, um, the cocoons would pose and move and then would completely 
just do whatever they want. So you're you're looking at textile, not just a flat textile, but actually a textile that's actually moving and creating its own shape and motion. Um, you can go to the next one, please. And finally, I am um, community is very important to me. I have been doing weaving together. Weaving together is um, I go and weaving hand my weaving studio from Brooklyn, New York. We go to different location and we activate weaving um, projects with community. So, and also environment is very important to me, making sure that we are telling the younger generation to take care of mother earth. So recyclable materials, um, fabric strips, we don't want them in the landfill. We wanna make sure that we can recycle and weave them. This one was in uh, Washington Square Park. No, in Union Square, Union Square Park. And it was the Earth Day celebration in, um, I can't see, I think the, the year before. And the most recent one is the one in Queens just last month where I woke with the Filipino community and we did a weaving to heal, gathering the community, uh, Filipino community. I know it was a pandemic, but we did it. Everybody was social distancing. We're gonna do the same thing starting tomorrow at the museum. And I am gonna be weaving a project, take care of one another. So we are in a place right now that we need to take care of one another. It's, it's very, very important. So we're asking for people to send in their healing messages, whatever it is. I think there's a link in the website. You could also DM me, you know, put it on the Instagram and I will, we will write it on a strip of uh, textiles and then I'm gonna weave them so we can have a collective message of healing and love that we all get through this pandemic. I'm just gonna read one that my best friend sent me. She said, prayers for calm, peace and compassion and discovery for a safe, effective vaccine. Thank you, Mary, for sending that. So yes, so that's, that's it. But I wanna talk a little bit about Peters Valley and how, as I'm gonna echo Vivian and Elizabeth, it was very formative for me because I received the 2008 uh, Peters Valley Art Educator Scholarship. I just opened my studio, Weaving Hand 2007, and I went to the place, you know, I'm from Brooklyn, so we don't have a lot of trees, we don't have nature, and it just blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, look at this place. I mean, it was just really so intoxicating to be around the looms in this um, environment with trees. So that was really my first opening to a craft school that besides having a college or going to like a regular place, you have this other place that really embrace you and allow you to let go of your artistic essence. That's what it was. It was the essence that opened me up. And from then on, I was constantly like wanting to have that feeling again. But thank you for giving me that, that experience and where I am right now, the community is really important. So hopefully we'll get to see you tomorrow. And I'm there October 4th, 10, 17 and 24 from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then after me, another artist will come. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you so much. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen, um, who's gonna do just a little Q&A with us and all of the panelists. Kristen, yep, I think you're still muted. Okay, uh, you're still muted. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Thank you so much for these wonderful presentations. It just makes my heart go pitter patter. <laughs> um, Patricia Muller is asking or saying, Janet, you taught me to crochet at Peters Valley and my work still reflects your influence. Do you still crochet? Um, I crocheted 10 years. I machine knit 10 years, I hand knit 10 years, and now I'm painting and printmaking, but everything I do looks like textiles. And you can see my work at, um, on my website, JanetLipkin.com, but it is really fun to be here after 50 years. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Shili Sal is asking, what is the material of the seat, Vivian Beer? 
Uh, it's concrete. Concrete. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So concrete and steel. And there's, when you go to see it in person, there's lovely, lovely rust in some of the areas. Um, rust isn't always the enemy, even for metal workers. <laughs> Um, okay, we have a question from Robert Bliss. Do you find that designing digitally changes the creative process for you, Vivian, or any of you that might use that technique? It's a, that's a really interesting question. We could spend a lot of time unpacking that. Uh, I think for the example in, um, uh, in this exhibit, I actually sent Elizabeth a full-size piece, a concept model, and a miniature. And one of the things that the digital design and fabrication gives you is the ability to scale. So you can go from this miniature to larger object really easily. Um, and even for the miniatures that I make, I use the same jigging system. And instead of hydraulics, I use like a tiny little bender. Um, but the concept model looks and feels different than the miniature and looks and feels different than the piece, which I think is really interesting because the concept model has, it's sort of, I made it in a few hours. I just wanted to kind of get the idea out there so I could look at it and then refine it from there. So uh, with the digital design in this case, I was actually refining the idea. Um, and I do a lot of things to try to, to try to keep the digital design from applying its mathematical formulas on what I'm making. And I use model making in order to kind of go back into my history as a sculptor and um, my hands, mind, heart, craftsman, um, and have that still work in the digital sphere. Great, thank you. Um, Shili Sal is asking, did Cynthia help set up a volunteer weaving at one of the Peters Valley weekends? Maybe the festival of demonstrations on site. I remember doing that there, I believe. You're muted, Cynthia. Um, unfortunately, I, I did not do any no. thing yeah, community at Peters Valley. I know we've set some up in the past during our open house, um, but thank you for asking, um, Sheely. And um, Sandra Dudley, uh, Malcolm, are you using a pottery wheel to form your shapes? Uh, yes, currently I use the, the uh, wheel as a starting point for the distorted vessels that I make, but uh, the piece that I showed in the second slide was uh, completely hand-built and I vacillate between any of those forming techniques. And to piggyback on the earlier question that Vivian was dealing with, with uh, rapid prototyping and CAD CAM design, uh, I wasn't able to send uh, uh, some of the work that I do in that way for this exhibition, but I know that Elizabeth was interested, interested in the work that I was making in that way. And I'm, I'm deeply invested in using uh, CAD CAM methodologies as a, a parallel to making in raw clay. So we start with this amorphous lump of unformed mass and we turn it into whatever. Uh, the same thing is true of these uh, null spaces of a, a file and we have to use that pure plastic space to invent. And I believe that uh, we practitioners of crafts have a leg up in the inventive intuitive space of computer uh, tool making and, and thinking because we know the physics of form. We know the physics of materials and we use those in uh, intuitions uh, organically as we're dealing with the with a quasi restrictive space of a, a CAD CAM file and you actually come up with inventive ways of solving problems that are very, very, I think, tactile or now anal analogous to tactile decisions. And I think that's a unique and, and special uh, contribution we can make to the digital field. That's great. Well, um, are there any other questions? If you have a question, here's your moment. Um, if you want to share your messages for Cynthia, you can put them into the chat. Um, but I think this wraps up our presentation for tonight. Um, Elizabeth? Yes. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming for participating i hope you will go and see if you're able the exhibition in person if you are not we will have a virtual a fairly robust virtual version on the website um, and we just so appreciate um, everyone being here tonight 
and um, sharing their stories and being with us to celebrate together. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be making Bye. this recording um, available on Facebook and on YouTube. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Oh, there were a couple more questions that came up last minute, but thank you. Oh, Susan Francisco, who's the um, daughter of the original founder, um, said that she knows her mom would have appreciated all all the people what the all the people are creating. It's really beautiful, actually. I got to dive into her history quite a bit, and she was a real. A real crackerjack arts administrator, doing a lot with a little. And we're still doing that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This is, yeah. That's great. Thank, Thank you guys for having me. me. All right. Thank Thanks, everyone. I think you guys are good. Great. Thank you. Thank you for this. This was so wonderful, guys. I'm really super grateful. And, uh, and I also want to thank all the younger generations for keeping everything so inspirational and going. Oh, Jenna, I, I, could, have, I could have sat here for like hours listening to more stories. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you. <laughs> it's really great. And I have to say, Janet, watching your face. As you're watching the young, like as you're watching Lucy mm -hmm. and Cynthia talk, mm -hmm. it's really, it's very inspiring. And there is so much um, kind of as uh, that idea of full circle um, that Malcolm said is really, it really does come through remarkably. So it's really, it's wonderful to see. All right, well, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you everybody. Thank you. It was Bye. fabulous. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right. Thank Thanks, you guys. everyone.